Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Z, uh, who's uh, from University of Pennsylvania, and he's an uh, intern here. Uh, it's his second time interning here, and he will tell us about uh, exponential mechanism for social welfare from a uh, point of uh, view of privacy and efficiency and so on. Yep. Thanks, Nikhil, and hi, everyone. Thanks for coming for this talk. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, how to design mechanisms that are both truthful and differentially private. And this talk is based on a recent paper with my advisor, Sampath Cannon, and some follow-up discussion with Aaron Roth. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. So first, I'll go through some basic backgrounds about mechanism design, in particular, designing truthful mechanisms, and as well as differential privacy. And if you're already familiar with these two areas, feel free to take a nap for the first 15 minutes of the talk. Uh, and then after I go through the basics and make sure we're on the same page, I'll go, uh, go on and uh, talk about our main result, which is a general mechanism for um, getting both truthfulness and differential privacy simultaneously. And then at the end of the talk, I'll talk about some discussions, uh, which are some extensions of our results uh, some discussion about the model and conclude with a few open problems. So that's the plan of today's talk. Uh, first of all, let me start with a motivating example, which is this uh, oil field allocation scenario. Suppose the government now want to allocate a bunch of oil fields to uh, several companies, say BP, Shell, and so on. Now, for each oil field, different companies may have different values for it for various reasons. For example, maybe this gray oil field is, some, uh, is one on the Caribbean Sea, and BP is still troubled by the uh, oil spill accident a few years back, so uh, BP has less incentive of getting this another oil field in the Caribbean Sea, and maybe Shell has done some extensive research on the field and figure out uh, the amount of oil stored in the field is actually much larger than everyone else is thinking, uh, so Shell has more incentive for getting the field. And Similarly, we can make this assumption for all other oil fields. So basically, for each company and each oil field, there could be an arbitrary uh, value for the company getting that particular oil field. Now, what the government wants to do is to make a location between the oil fields and the companies. And just for the sake of presentation, I'll assume that each company will get exactly one oil field. We can it interpret this as uh, each company having uh, limited resource and cannot start more than one new oil field at a time, but this constraint is just for presentation purposes. It's not a restriction for our result. So what the government wants to do uh, by making such a location? Since it's the government who's making the allocation, we will assume the government's goal is not to maximize revenue because after all, the government can just print some money. Uh, what the government wants to do is maximize the overall goodness of the society and that uh, one natural objective is what's so, so called social welfare, uh, which is defined to be the sum of each company's value on the oil field that it gets. And it's not difficult to see that once we make the uh, restriction that each company get exactly one oil field, the allocations are simply matchings between the companies and oil fields. And uh, the objective of maximizing social welfare is simply a max weight by part matching problem. So there are various ways of uh, uh, looking at this problem. For example, we can think about this as an algorithm design problem, in which case we want to design the, this wrap box in the middle, and which is kind of an input-output interface. What's the input to this wrap box is the private valuations of the agents, and what's the output of this uh, wrap box is some outcome from the feasible range, which in this example is simply the set of all possible byproduct matchings. And the goal is to maximize or minimize some objective function. In this case, it's the total weight of all the edges in the matching. And in particular, there's no, nothing so special about max matching. We can replace this problem by 
any algorithm design problem, say facility location, max cut, or symmetry, or any of your favorite algorithm problem. And any algorithm, algorithm design problem can, can be interpreted in this framework. So you have some minimization problem here. You can understand you know, maximization problems. You know, maximization right. How do the minimization problems fit in this framework? Uh, so so first of all, minimization and maximization are, are the same up to a negation. And also there could be a, um, say, mean cost flow or other uh, minimization problem up, uh, that also fit into this picture, right? Yeah, I don't understand how the minimization problems fit in. Uh, for example... Mm -hmm. What are the player valuations? And ah, that's right. So, so for minimization problem, it could be that each player uh, own one of the edges in the graph, and then the player has a cost for the, the maximum designer of choosing the edge. Let's say the maximum designer is uh, trying to purchase a set of edges that form a standard tree that connects a bunch of cities in, on the map. And it's, it's, it's kind of a yeah a procurement auction, but so far we haven't get into the auction setting. So so far it's just a uh, optimization problem, and any algorithm problem can be ca kind of viewed in this picture, right? Okay, so so if we we are thinking about the max matching problem in terms of algorithm design, then we are done because we all know that this uh, max weight by pattern matching can be solved in poly time and we can pick our favorite algorithm and just run it. But the real world situation is a bit different in the sense that all these input data are private information uh, held by these companies and throughout this talk, we will refer to this by, as agents uh, in the market. And since all these informations are private to the agents, we need to incentivize the agent to report their true values in order to uh, pick a reasonable outcome based on uh, this underlying data. So suppose we take this into account, what does the picture look like? Again, we want to design this red box in the middle, and in order to uh, make a difference from the algorithm viewpoint, I would call this red box a mechanism instead of an algorithm. So as the input, instead of the true underlying data, what we will be getting as input is simply the reported value from each of these individual agents, which may or may not equal the true underlying data. And based on this reported data, we need to pick some outcome, x, and as, along with a price ve uh, payment vector, p. This payment vector, p, uh, we should uh, interpret them as some tool that uh, play an important role in kind of incentivizing these agents reporting their true value. And then our goal, again, is to maximize or minimize some objective uh, with respect to the true underlying data. Okay, so now what's the goal? The goal is to incentivize the agents to report their true values so that we can uh, make our decision uh, and choose a reasonable outcome to maximize the true underlying objective. But in order to do so, we first need to understand why agents will lie about their valuations. What assumption, in particular, we need to make assumption about how agents will behave uh, in the market. So as a standard assumption in game theory and I, I guess in microeconomics in general, we assume that the agents will aim to maximize the expected utility, which it has this quasi-linear form equals the valuation of the outcome chosen by the mechanism minus the payment we charge the agent. And the conceptual, so, so, so what's the point? The point is that the agent will lie if lying can actually increase this quasi-linear utility. So we want to prevent that. The conceptual solution for this concern is to focus um, on the so-called truthful mechanisms. What is a truthful mechanism? A truthful mechanism is one where agents always maximizes this notion of quasi-linear utility by building their true value, no matter what the other agents do. Suppose we have this nice property, then we can say with, with confidence that there's no reason for the agents to lie, and therefore they should uh, report their true value, and 
And therefore, simply based on their reported value, we will be able to pick something reasonable. And one of the most famous um, examples of such truthful mechanism is probably the second price auction or its generalization known as the VCG mechanism, named after Wick, uh, Vickery, Clark, and Grovers, which essentially uh, choose an allocation which maximizes the overall happiness in the society, namely the uh, sum of the valuation of all agents over this outcome. And what they say is that uh, if you do that, then there's some general methods of deriving the payments that make it truthful. So, so far, so good. We are, we are able to handle truthfulness, at least for the social welfare maximization problem. And arguably, most, if not almost all, of the previous work in economics and as, long, as well as in uh, algorithmic game theory has been focused on this uh, truthfulness concern. And in fact, usually for most uh, game theory talk, this slide is the end of the introduction, and we will get into the uh, more precise model and results part. But what I'm going to do today is uh, slightly different. I want to argue that there's actually something else we need to worry about if we want to incentivize uh, agent to report their true values. This other concern is that agent or people c care about privacy. So over the past few years, uh, Users, uh, on, users has become uh, more and more aware of how their private data or their private information might be misused on the internet or by some other third-party databases. One famous example is the uh, 2008 paper on the anonymizing the Netflix database. So the story is that Netflix used to release this uh, database about um, which user put what kind of rate on and each of these movies. Of course, they also take an eye on uh, privacy, but what they do is simply make the database anonymous. So intuitively, anonymous should imply privacy, right? There's nothing you can learn about, about the individual agent's data once it's anonymous. But what this paper shows is that by combining this database with some other information from the internet, they can actually de-anonymize de this database and learn a lot about individual agents' information from the database. What they do is essentially um, using the fact that the agent not only submit rate to Netflix, they also submit rates to other places like uh, IMDB or uh, Amazon, which is not completely anonymous. And they use that to identify who each of these individual a agent is and then use that fact to uh, de-anonymize the whole database. And a more recent example of um, how people are becoming aware of privacy is the recent complaint filed by Epic against Facebook, saying that Facebook has misleading use of um, uh, agent, the user private information, and also has been sharing more information about uh, each individual agent um, than they should to third parties and advertisers. And this has resulted in uh, Facebook kind of has to fix all these uh, privacy issues and are subject to a uh, privacy audit every other year for something like 20 years from now. And taking a step back to the toy example that we consider at the beginning of this talk in that oil field allocation example, all these valuations of the companies are sensitive business secret in the following sense. So a company's value on each individual oil field may comprise information about an extensive research of the company has done on the area and also include information about, for example, maybe a um, company has recent breakthrough and drilling technology and stuff like that, which the company consider as competitive edge in the future business, and they do not want to reveal them to their competitors in the market. And suppose we run the traditional uh, mechanism, say the VCG mechanism, that almost for sure that will leak non-trivial information about all these private values. And therefore, even if the mechanism is truthful, a privacy-aware company or privacy-aware agent may still choose to lie about the value or not to participate in the auction in order to protect their privacy. So the challenge here, motivated by all this example, the challenge here is to how to get good privacy and at the same time still get nearly optimal objective. And this has been a, 
a relatively new area known as differential privacy over the past few years. But so far, I haven't really defined what is privacy because privacy is a vague word. For example, in the first example, we have seen that uh, making the database anonymous is not enough to guarantee privacy. So what precisely do we mean by privacy? So ideally, what we want is that by participating in this database, any third party should not be in, able to learn too much about my private information. So more precisely, suppose I fix the participants and values of all other agents and consider me reporting truthfully, reporting VI, and reporting lie about my validation and by reporting VI prime, this mechanism presumably will choose outcomes from two different distributions. And what privacy means is that by simply looking at one or a few samples from these two distributions, the adversarial should not be able to distinguish these two cases. And more precisely, we will say the, um, the mechanism has good privacy if the distribution of these two cases has distance, some notion of distance and most epsilon for any fixed uh, um, values of other agents and any way of uh, lying about my true value. So what remains is that to define uh, what notion of distance between distributions that we, need, we choose to define this privacy. And there's a long story here which I'm not going to get into. So I'll, the notion of distance we will use here is the infinite divergence between these two distributions. So what does that mean? We will say a mechanism is differentially private if I fix the value of other agents and change my value from VI to VI prime, then the probability that any subset of outcomes being chosen by the mechanism should not change by more than a multiplicative e to the epsilon factor. So what does that mean is that, suppose I look at this uh, uh, probability density curve in the two cases where I lie about my value and I report truthfully, then the probability dense point-wise should be bounded by this e to the epsilon factor. So when you combine this, um, when you look at it from a truthfulness point of view, mm -hmm. this says, OK, uh, if I lie, uh, let's say your mechanism is truthful. Right. You don't gain anything. But this is saying, on the other hand, you'll also not lose or will also not lose much. Because somehow, doesn't it mean that, uh, doesn't this imply that even if I lie, I don't, I don't lose? Yeah, that's a point I will get to uh, in the second part. So I guess, so what Nikhil says is essentially that if a mechanism is differentially private, then it also implies it's approximately truthful because by lying, I cannot change the outcome distribution by too much, and therefore I cannot gain too much by lying, right? But um, there's a problem with that because ideally, when we talk about approximate truthfulness, what we want is we can get closer and closer to um, exact truthfulness without hurting the objective that we are trying to maximize or minimize. However, by using this approach, if we want to get arbitrarily close to truthfulness, then we need to get arbitrarily close to perfectly private. When we get to perfect privacy, then essentially all that we can do is the trivial thing of essentially picking a random outcome from all possible outcomes uniformly at random, which is very poor in, in terms of objective. So what I was saying is actually, if you impose this constraint, you right. know, Reasonably small epsilon. Mm -hmm. Then yes, uh, let's say you you have truthfulness. Truthfulness right. is nice. Uh, nobody can gain okay. by lying. But this constraint also says nobody can lose by lying. Exactly. So yeah, that that's another critic of di directly using differential privacy as a notion of truthfulness. But what we will do, what we will be, we'll be doing is by imposing payments and uh, with the help of payment, we can actually incentivize agent to tell the truth even if the outcome is kind of smooth and does not change much, uh, if no matter what I tell. Okay, I see. Outcome is 
outcome does not include the payment. Yeah, the outcome does not include payment at this point. And this guarantee only holds when only one agent, everybody is telling the truth, but one you try to lie. Uh, no, it's actually, it should hold no matter what other agents do. So I, I should probably put a VI, V minus I prime just to uh, say that fact. So V, v minus I need not be the true value of other agents. Mm -hmm. But that is fixed between the two. Yeah. yeah. So, and also for Usually, we will assume epsilon is some small constant or even you know, small O of 1. So e to the epsilon is really 1 plus epsilon. But we choose this definition because uh, for technical reason, and it's usually the standard definition in differential privacy as well. So, but we, you, you can imagine it as 1 plus epsilon if that works more towards your uh, intuition. So. Um, so I have given the definition of different differential privacy, but um, let me also spend uh, two more slides to uh, build some intuition about what is differential privacy and what's the general way of getting differential privacy. So first of all, it's not difficult to see that no non-trivial de deterministic mechanism can be differentially private because any event that's chosen with probability zero at one particular input has to remain zero for all inputs. So the best we can do is simply choose a fixed outcome no matter what the input is. That means we have to use randomness. The problem is how to use randomness. So to get an intuition, uh, I'll briefly go through two general methods of using randomness to get differential privacy, which is also uh, particularly related to our work. They are just uh, input perturbation and exponential mechanism. So let's first talk about the first method, input perturbation. The idea is to perturb the market itself. So other than the original agent 1 to n, I'll add a bunch of dummy agents into the market whose value is drawn uniformly at random from all possible uh, valuations. And, and then what we will do is to run the optimization problem um, on this enlarged market with the original agent and this dummy agents to choose the outcome, and if necessary, project the outcome back to the original market. So more concretely, think about this matching market, right? I can add a bunch of dummy companies and then find the max matching in that case, and then only keep the edges that's uh, adjacent to the actual company as my outcome. And the hope is that by adding enough um, randomness by adding dummy agents with random valuation, the whole market looks random enough and therefore it's differentially private. So what's the pro of this approach? The pro is that it's extremely simple and it's oblivious uh, for which algorithm you're using in the middle and also oblivious to uh, the structure of the uh, problem. So no matter we can take the algorithm as a black box and without knowing anything about the problem, we can still use the, this approach to enforce differential privacy. But of course that comes with a price. Since this method does not use any specific property and structures of the problem, as you can expect, it usually achieves very poor uh, objective for most of the problems. In fact, it only works for uh, very restricted settings where essentially uh, the total number of different valuations for the agents is much smaller than the number of agents in the market. So what does this tell us is, is that in order to get something more general and works for more problems, we need to use specific structures of the problems. And arguably, the only way we know of using specific structures of the problem while still general enough uh, for all problems is the exponential mechanism. Yeah. How do we assign values to uh, the dummy? Uh, Uniformly at random from all possible valuations. Only from the given ones or like all possible? All possible. So, you, we, so we know all possible. So we assume that we know. Yeah, yeah. We, we, okay, yeah. We, we have to have some knowledge about the problem. Also, we need some knowledge to project this outcome back to the original market. But that's pretty much it. I, I don't take any too specific structure of the problems. So the exponential mechanism is uh, originally proposed by 
Frank uh, McSherry and uh, Canal Tawar in 2007, what the exponential mechanism do is to choose the outcome x from the feasible range with probability proportional to the exponent of the performance of this outcome, scaled by the epsilon, which is the privacy parameter, and over divided by two, 2 delta, where delta is the Lipschitz constant of this f function in terms of uh, v, v, v1 to vn. But for the purpose of this talk, we can always assume delta is 1 because I always scale the function properly so that the Lipschitz constant is 1. So let's ignore delta for now. So thank you for maximization. Exactly. But uh, yeah, right now I'm assuming this is a maximization problem. If it's a minimization problem, I'll have to take the negation over here. So uh, there's some nice thing about this uh, exponential mechanism. First of all, it's always absolutely differentially private, no matter what the problem is. And this is not difficult to verify. And moreover, it could be the right answer for differential privacy if we ignore computational efficiency. So Aaron, Aaron Roth actually conjectured that this is the right answer, but I'm more conservative towards this conjecture. But as a matter of fact, it has been proved to be asymptotically optimal in terms of a trade-off between the objective function and privacy for many problems. For example, counting queries, combinatorial public projects, k-medians, and set cover, and many other problems. And we do not know a single count example where this exponential mechanism is not asymptotically optimal, ignoring the computational efficiency matter. So, and actually, this is the mechanism we'll be playing with and get truthfulness out of it. So I think it's important to that everyone understand the definition of this mechanism. And is there any question about? OK, if there's no question about the settings and uh, about mechanism design and differential privacy, I'll move on to the second part, which is how to kill one burst, uh, kill two bursts with one stone, kind of uh, combine the techniques from mechanism design and differential privacy to get both truthfulness and differential privacy at the same time. OK, let, let me first, you know, I hate definition, but let me spend one slide to make sure we are on the same page. Uh, we assume there are n agents and some feasible range of outcome R. And then each agent has some private values uh, matching from R to 0, 1. I choose this interval 0, 1 because I want to make sure the social welfare function has Lipschitz constant 1 uh, in terms of its, each individual agent's input. And the objective is to choose an uh, outcome from the range to maximize the social welfare, which is defined to be the sum of the agent's value on this outcome chosen. And since we will be considering a uh, randomized mechanism, the objective will be maximizing the expected social welfare. And I, truthfulness and differential privacy is, as we defined in the previous slides, I want to make one remark here about our definition of differential privacy. That is, so I'm assuming in this talk that we only consider the differential privacy issue of the allocations. But in real world, the payments may leak information as well. So, we do handle payments in our paper, but the reason I don't want to talk about that is the techniques for handling payment is quite standard. And essentially, just add some Laplacian noise in the, the, into the payments. And I really feel the differential privacy concern of the allocation is the more interesting part. So that's what I'm going to talk about in the talk and ignore the payments. So given the model, what's the general question we are trying to attack? What we are trying to attack is that can we design mechanisms? Can we find a general ways of designing mechanisms that simultaneously achieve all four of the following? We want to have differential privacy. We want to have truthfulness. We want to get near optimal social welfare subject to the privacy constraint. And as computer scientists, we want computational efficiency. But of course, I'm being too greedy by saying I want to achieve all four of these because even ignoring the uh, differential privacy part 
getting truthfulness, good social welfare, and computational efficiency is the central problem in algorithmic game theory for the last 10, 12 years, and we're still far from being able to completely un understand that. So there's no hope to answer this question in one shot. So what our strategy is, is to um, first focus on the first three objectives, differential privacy, truthfulness, and good social welfare, and provide something as general as VCG. And then uh, on a problem by problem basis, we can consider the computational efficiency issue. And in this talk, I'll only talk about the interaction of the first three part, which I feel is the more interesting part. So, um, so there are different models of saying getting truthfulness and privacy at the same time, but I feel I have already thrown in too many definitions right now. So instead of uh, distracting you guys with different definitions, I'll simply state my choice of model, and then at the end of the talk, I'll justify uh, why I feel this is the more appropriate model to use. So what we are going to assume is that agents will not participate in the auction unless the mechanism is absolutely differentially private. And once the agent chooses to participate, then they will aim to maximize the usual notion of quasi-linear utility. So under this assumption, what we need to do to incentivize agent to report a true value is to design a mechanism whose allocation rule is absolutely differentially private. And the allocation rule together with the payment satisfies the new usual notion of truthfulness. Okay. Now suppose we take this assumption, what is known already uh, in this model? So it turns out that suppose we only want any two of these three objectives, we already know what to do. If we want welfare and truthfulness, we can simply run the VCG mechanism, which get optimal social welfare and perfectly truthful. Suppose we want good social welfare and differential privacy, then arguably we can use exponential mechanism to achieve the optimal trade-off. At least that's the case for many problems. Suppose we only want truthfulness and privacy, then we have the trivial solution of always picking an outcome that's independent of the input, which is perfectly truthful and perfectly private, but of course has very poor uh, social welfare. So the real challenge is getting all three of those. And even this has been considered before. So in the original paper that McSherry and Tawat proposed this exponential mechanism, they also point out that differential privacy actually implies approximate truthfulness, like Nikhil just uh, pointed out. What that means is that, by definition, lying cannot change the outcome distribution by too much, and therefore I cannot gain too much, as long as the uh, mechanism is absolutely differentially private. And therefore, that implies uh, approximate truthfulness. And Nikhil also has uh, made some critics about this approach that although people have less, not, not much inf incentive to lie, they don't have much incentive to tell the truth as well. And also, uh, we cannot get arbitrarily to uh, true exact truthfulness without hurting the uh, objective function. So that's not as appealing solution concept as we would like to. So in order to handle that, there's some follow-up paper by uh, Nisim et al. in 2012, and also independently by Hala and Lucia in 2010. They show how to convert this nearly truthful mechanism into exactly truthful ones in some specific settings. But first of all, this way of converting it into exact truthful mechanism only works for very restricted settings. And also, after this conversion, the mechanism is no longer differentially private. So we're getting truthfulness, but on the same time, we're losing privacy. And as a attempt, as a attempt to uh, getting truthfulness and privacy at the same time, David Shaw studied the mechanism design without payment and proposed using input perturbation as a general method of doing so. so what does that mean? Input perturbation means I'll add a bunch of uh, random agents into the market as before, and in the middle, I'll use a truthful mechanism in the red box. And therefore, uh, this mechanism with respect to the original agent should still be truthful. But of course, as we say that input perturbation only works for uh, very restrictive settings, and this method is not as general as we want. 
So what we proved is there's actually a very general method of getting um, differential privacy and truthfulness at the same time for very general setting. So first we call the exponential mechanism is to choose an outcome x proportional to uh, the exponent of the social welfare scale by the privacy parameter. What we show is that for any mechanism design problem, as long as the objective is social welfare, the exponential mechanism can be coupled with some proper payments to make it truthful, exactly truthful. So how we should interpret this? In some sense, this is a uh, family of generalization of VCG mechanism with, for which by scaling the epsilon from positive infinity to zero, we can have a family of differentially private version of VCG. When epsilon goes to infinity, this is the VCG mechanism because we will always choose the uh, outcome which maximizes the social welfare. When epsilon goes to zero, we get this uh, perfectly private but trivial kind of uniformly at random picking an uh, outcome uniformly at random from the feasible range. So when you say uh, differentially private, mm -hmm. is it also like consider the payments as also part of this yes. output? So. Uh, yes, so, so there are two parts of outcomes actually. So the first outcome is um, what I refer to as outcome as outcome in the feasible range and that has something to do with the social welfare and that part has to be differential private. But also the payment part has to be differential private, right? But as I mentioned, um, there are very standard tricks of payments, um, standard tricks for the payments to make it differential private as we can add some zero mean noises to the payments. And since the agent only aim to maximize the expected utility, that doesn't change, really change their uh, utility, assuming risk, risk neutral. And therefore, uh, I will focus on the uh, differential privacy concern of the simply the outcome. And also depending on how much you believe in that conjecture that exponential mechanism is the right answer for differential privacy, we can say that for many problems, differential privacy is compatible with truthfulness, at least for this maximum design with payment setting. So before I move on to the proof, is there any question about the statement? Okay. So there are different ways of proving this theorem. In fact, the original proof we have is a bit complicated, but later we found a very cool proof by making a connection to physics. So let me first introduce some background, some essentially some high school or college physics. So the notion I, I want to talk about is Gibbs measure. So, or Boltzmann distribution sometimes uh, in statistical physics. So consider some particles of a gas in a container and assume this particle, this gas has a K energy states E1 to EK. What the Gibbs measure or the Boltzmann distribution says is that suppose I pick a random particle from the container, then the probability that it has state J is proportional to the exponent of the negative energy of the state divided by the Boltzmann constant and the temperature, okay? And this sometimes is also known in a less precise language as nature prefers low energy as lower the energy is, the higher this probability is, or a higher temperature implies more chaotic system as t goes to infinity, we will have a uniform distribution over all possible states. So then I would like to make the simple observation that the exponential mechanism itself is a Gibbs measure. So here's a, I want to uh, verify this observation by this table. So I guess simply by staring at the probability density function or mass function, we can already see the, see the similarity between these two guys, but let me make it more precise. So in the Gibbs measure setting, nature wants to minimize the energy. And in terms of exponential mechanism, they want to maximize this notion of social welfare. So the social welfare and the negative energy are playing similar roles in the probability max function. And also in both settings, we have some parameter which um, specify how chaotic the system is. In Gibbs measure, we have the temperature, and in exponential mechanism, we have the privacy parameter, where the smaller this privacy parameter is, uh, the more cha chaotic the system needs to be because we want more privacy. 
And these two guys are also playing a similar role in the system. So where are we going with this? The point is there has been a lot of study uh, for Gibbs measure or Boltzmann distribution by statistical physics. And by making a connection between these two guys, we can borrow some of the theorems and truths from Gibbs measure and use that to prove our result. So more precisely, the notion I want to borrow from Gibbs measure is the notion of free energy. So what's a free energy? Suppose we have a distribution D. Uh, the free energy of this di distribution at temperature T is the expected energy, suppose the state is drawn from this distribution, minus the Shannon entropy of the distribution multiplied by Kb times T. And it turns out that this fully characterizes the Gibbs measure as Gibbs measure is the distribution that minimizes the free energy. And sometimes this is also known as uh, nature maximizes the entropy given the expected energy level. And this can be easily verified uh, either by taking the uh, first order condition of this uh, uh, minimization problem, or uh, there are very various ways. But I, I'm not going to bother you with the math here. So just trust me, this is true for now. Since we have made a connection between Gibbs measure and exponential mechanism, we can translate this fact into the language of exponential mechanism, right? So what that means is that the exponential mechanism actually is maximizing this guy, which for fun, I just call it the free social welfare. So the free social welfare is the expected social welfare, suppose the outcome is chosen from that distribution, plus the Shannon entropy of the distribution scaled by two over epsilon. This is simply by uh, replacing the corresponding ter uh, terms in the probability mass function and translate the uh, previous fact in the language of uh, exponential, exponential mechanism. So if you are familiar with game theory and mechanism design, this actually implies the exponential mechanism is a uh, maximum distributed range allocation. And therefore, there are standard techniques to make it truthful. And in case you don't see that, I have one slide which explains why this is the case. Okay. So in order to see why the exponential mechanism is truthful, uh, imagine the following imaginary, imaginary market where instead of choosing outcomes, we are choosing uh, distribution of outcomes. And each of the in, uh, agent in the original market now translate to an agent which maximizes the uh, expected valuation uh, with respect to that distribution. But I want to add a, an additional agent into the market who's a pure risk lover whose utility is simply the Shannon entropy of the outcome distribution scaled by 2 over epsilon. Now what the VCG mechanism will do in this imaginary market is to maximize the social welfare with respect to the original agent plus this additional risk lever, right? So it turns out that the social welfare in this imaginary market is exactly the uh, free social welfare uh, which characterizes the exponential mechanism. And therefore, um, the outcome is essentially the same for this imaginary market uh, with VCG mechanism and exponential mechanism in the original market. And therefore, we can translate back the payments to the original market and make it truthful. Okay, and that's the end of our proof for the main theorem. Uh, now, is there any question about the uh, main results before I move on to further discussion part? All right, so uh, as I promised, I'll uh, talk about what are the other uh, models for capturing privacy and truthfulness and at, at the same time and why we choose our model instead of theirs and also talk about some extensions of our results and conclude with a few open problems. So what's the other options of modern privacy? The other option, seemingly a more natural option, is to model privacy via the utility function. In other words, we want to kind of capture how much information has been leaked by the mechanism. 
and then define a disutility of the agent, which is monotone in this privacy loss due to particip participating in the mechanism, and then assume the agent trying to maximize the usual notion of utility minus this disutility. Okay, this is seemingly a more natural option of capturing privacy uh, into the uh, framework of mechanism design. And this has been considered by David Shaw and uh, Yiling Chen et al. Uh, in two papers in 2011. However, uh, Nassim et al. actually point out this assumption is a bit problematic for the following reason. In order to compute this privacy loss, the agent not only need to know his own utility, his own valuation, but also need to know what other agents report. In other words, we are in this dilemma where assuming, suppose we are in the perfect information setting where agents know each other's uh, values, in which case they have enough information to evaluate their disutility. But since we are in this perfect information setting, there's not much incentive to taking this privacy issue into the picture because everything is public. And suppose agents do not know each other's valuation, then it's funny to say that agents actually maximize a utility which they do not have enough information to evaluate. So we need to be a bit more careful in terms of choosing the model. Uh, okay, so, so because uh, the usual notion of privacy loss we, we can define is some kind of um, distance between the probability distribution, whether I lie or I tell the truth, right? And that distribution not only affect by my behavior, but also depend on what other agents tell the mechanism. And therefore, in order to evaluate how much information is leaked by the mechanism, the agent also need to know what other agents report. And actually, uh, Nisim Adam and Yilin Chen Adam provide some partial solution, and they are quite generic. So what they do is they do not assume any specific form of this disutility function and simply assume there's some disutility which agents have in enough information to evaluate. But this disutility is upper bounded by uh, this privacy loss epsilon. And then they consider problems uh, where we can design strictly truthful mechanisms. And once we do that, then we can say that as long as the mechanism is private enough, then the gain in privacy for lying is not enough to compensate the loss in value, valuation uh, by lying. Because strictly truthfulness means I will lose some fixed amount if I lie about my valuation. And therefore, as long as the mechanism is private enough, it will be truthful even for these uh, privacy-aware agents. However, since we do not assume any specific form of the disutility function, arguably, this is the best we can do. This, we cannot design very uh, specific mechanisms uh, which take the form of the disutility function into the picture. And therefore, this approach, again, only works for very specific problems. And the line of attack I want to propose here, also as the first open question, is how about Bayesian setting? Because in Bayesian setting, people have enough information to evaluate their privacy loss in expectation. And therefore, uh, it, it seems OK to assume specific uh, form of this utility function. And therefore, there's hope to handle more general settings, even by um, modeling privacy into the utility function. So this is the first um, kind of open questions from the talk. And next, I'll talk about some extensions of our main result. So first of all, notice that the connection between exponential mechanism and Gibbs measure and our main theorem actually does not really use the fact that uh, we are take using social welfare as our objective function. So in general, for any problem, the exponential mechanism is essentially maximizing the expected performance 
shifted by the Shannon entropy of the outcome distribution scaled by 2 over epsilon, right? And this actually gives some intuition why it works so well for many problems because in some sense, exponential mechanism is maximizing entropy given the performance level and privacy in some sense is trying to maximize uncertainty in the system. And in a hand-waving manner, uh, entropy is ap approximately uncertain, the level of uncertainty in the system. However, uh, it seems very tricky to make this hand-waving kind of intuition more precise because differential privacy is not defined um, in a way using en entropy. It's defined using like how much the distance between uh, probability distribution condition on whether this agent lies or not. So I think it's an interesting open question to uh, trying to make this connection more precise given that the exponential mechanism actually achieve optimal differential privacy for so many problems. There, I, I personally believe there has to be a uh, more intriguing connection between these two guys. Another extension uh, need to use an alternative interpretation of our main theorem. So it's well known that maximizing entropy is the same as minimizing the KL divergence to uniform distribution. So I can alternatively write the characterization as exponential mechanism is actually maximizing the um, expected performance minus the distance KL divergence to uniform distribution scaled by uh, some proper factors. The point here is that there's nothing so special about uniform, right? Uniform is, what uniform do here is serving as a default distribution over all possible outcomes. And if the problem has some nice symmetric uh, over different outcomes in the feasible range, maybe uniform is a reasonable choice. However, for some problems, maybe some outcome is obviously uh, worse off compared to other outcomes, and in those cases, we should put less pro uh, weight on that outcome in the default distribution, even maybe put zero weight on the uh, default distribution. So, so up, due to that observation, we can derive a, a more generalized version for uh, this characterization. So the generalized exponential mechanism, which take a uh, outcome x proportional to, again, e to the, uh, actually that, that should not be social welfare, but arbitrary perfor uh, performance of that outcome scaled by the uh, privacy parameter, and then also sh kind of biased by this prior distribution p of x, can actually be characterized as ma maximizing the expected social uh, performance uh, minus the divergence to this default distribution p. And this generalized version actually captures most of the uh, extensions and uh, of the exponential mechanism in the previous literature. For example, sometimes people just pick a subset of outcomes which form a nice uh, geometric covering of the outcome space in terms of this objective function and then use exponential mechanism only on that subset of outcomes. That can be captured by choosing P to be a uniform distribution over uh, that subset of outcomes. And what this means is that all these previous extension of mechanism are also truthful if the objective are social welfare. So our technique is actually compatible with all those um, ad hoc tricks or uh, extensions of exponential mechanism. And why, why was that done? Sorry? Why, what was the like, end result? So why, why was only a subset of them chosen? To... Why were these extensions necessary? Oh, yeah. So, so first of all, choosing a, only a subset of outcomes may improve the computational efficiency for that the underlying uh, outcome space could be exponentially large. and the naive way of implementing uh, exponential mechanism is has running time kind of uh, linear in the size of the uh, outcome space, right? So that could potentially improve the running time. And sometimes that could improve the uh, privacy and objective trade-off as well. If you eliminate bad notes and you get better, you don't have to give bad notes. Yeah, so sometimes some of the outcomes are obviously bad. For example, in the matching setting, right, we can also include partial matchings into the picture, but that's obviously bad, and therefore I, I want to eliminate those uh, matchings into the, uh, in, in the outcome space. 
Okay. Now, finally, let, let me conclude with two, uh, two more open problems. The first open problem is, uh, has something to do with having differentially private mechanism that answers query online. So now let's take a step back and from the, this mechanism design literature and back to the, this database and answering queries kind of uh, scenario. Suppose we have a database about information, say, of every, everybody in this building 99. And want, I want to answer queries such as, uh, what's the fraction of people in this building who has blue eyes or who has uh, brown hairs? This is like a typical um, database uh, query releasing uh, scenario. And quite often, these queries actually comes online. They are not given upfront, and you, 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 you kind of pick the optimal way of perturbing uh, and using randomness to answer all of them and ensure differential privacy. And that's exactly what exponential mechanisms do. So a challenging area in differential privacy is how to answer this query online and still uh, being able to uh, achieve optimal trade-off between the uh, error and differential privacy. So what you can obviously do is add independent noise to all these queries, right? But sometimes that's suboptimal because maybe the first query is what's the fraction who, has, uh, who have blue eyes and the other is who do not have blue eyes. Then it would be stupid to use uh, two independent perturbation for these two queries and you really want to use one of them. And this gap can be made arbitrarily large. They could be highly correlated and in which case you want to uh, only add a few noises into the picture. So, there has been some work done in this literature, and this online mechanism actually performs very well. They actually get error bound close to this offline exponential mechanism. But it's very mysterious why they are behaving so well. So the next open problem is towards understanding that. So we have essentially characterized the exponential mechanism as a, the optimal solution of a convex program. And there are algorithms for solving convex programs where the constraints comes online. The problem is, can we combine those techniques and this characterization to understand and maybe even improve this online differentially private mechanism? So what does uh, the exponential mechanism mean for this database queries? Because for okay. optimization, we had the Right, right, model. exactly. So now the objective will be to minimize let's say the uh, L-infinity error of all these uh, answers, or maybe uh, L2, L2 errors of all these um, answer. And we have this, uh, we can view this as a minimization problem now, and the exponential mechanism can be used to solve that, right? And all those are uh, online, some of these online uh, differentially private mechanisms actually achieve similar error bound, even comparing to this exponential mechanism, which presumably is optimal if you're given all these queries upfront, up to some uh, small log factors. So it's very mysterious why they are able to do so well. Um, Accuracy and privacy. So it depends on individual settings. So for example, uh, for the, the kind of counting queries that I'm uh, talking about, say, what's the fraction of people who have blue eyes and stuff like that, if the, um, the queries are actually kind of random enough, then it's known exponential mechanism is optimal. And even for arbitrary counting query, it's conjecture that that's optimal. I mean, uh, it's not probably not a, that well-accepted conjecture, but uh, we don't have a counterexample where exponential mechanism is not optimal with respect to that kind of query. Offline, offline, even offline, and suppose we leave the computational efficiency issue aside, then we don't have a counterexample where it is not optimal. It's in particularly optimal. And the last open question is, how about mechanism design without payments? So what our result essentially says is that 
differential privacy and truthfulness are compatible if we are allowed to use payments. But on the other hand, our approach heavily relies on the use of payments. And in particular, David Shaw showed that the exponential mechanism is not truthful without payments for some problems. And therefore, an interesting uh, open problem is to consider the literature of exponential mechanism without payments and can we still get uh, exact truthfulness and differential privacy at the same time within this framework. And uh, that's all for the talk. And thank you for coming. Yep. So your mechanism is truthful in expectation? Yeah, truthful in expectation, that's right. Universal truthfulness? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So actually, I, our result do not imply that there's a universal truthful mechanism. And to my knowledge, uh, I don't know any result in that uh, regard. But uh, that might be an interesting thing to explore as well. Any other questions? So like the way you define differential privacy, you right. said that if you define it in terms of some kind of entropy, then it would be then the, your conjecture is that uh, this exponential mechanism is the right one. It would be straightforward. The only problem is the right, right, the way right. you define differential privacy, that constraint is not an entropy constraint. So right. So one thing also very mysterious is that exponential mechanism, once we view it in, as a characterized by this convex program, is defined on a point-wise manner in the sense that given any input data, we can compute the differential mechanism, kind of, uh, kind of maximizing this convex program, which completely determined by the input data at that particular point. But differential privacy is defined on a kind of a, uh, comparing the distribution of any two neighboring databases. So there's a mismatch here. And it's not clear why with, with, with this uh, mismatch, exponential mechanism is still being able to do so well uh, with respect to the definition of differential privacy. So I had a comment on the question. Okay. So this kind of uh, the welfare plus the care divergence, uh -huh. that looks very uh, much like what they do in machine learning with the IRT exactly, regularization exactly. term. Yeah. So that's like actually turns out to be the right thing to do for online learning. I see. Where you just maximize the whatever uh, whatever you've seen so far. Uh, yeah. Plus some regularization. That's right. And I mean, you can think of this the multiplicative upgrade as coming from uh, doing such an optimization. Right? Yeah, exactly. So maybe you can use some. some yeah. So that that's an in interesting e direction to explore as well. So. There, even without this result, there has been known that there's a close connection between learning and differential privacy, and many of the results can be translated from one literature to the other. So it would be interesting to see what that means uh, in learning. And in some sense, it's differential privacy is trying to prevent someone from learning your uh, data. So they are like dual problems in some sense. I mean, of, of course, in a hand-waving sense. But uh, we also kind of look. Help in your goal of uh, doing this and doing the queries online. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's worth looking at this online learning literature and see uh, what that means. Actually, that um, Aaron has a result showing that any no regret learning algorithm can be translated into a online uh, query release mechanism, which is differentially private, and different error bound can be obtained for different. Uh, uh, no regret learning algorithm.